I look back and I began to materially increase my own holdings uh, of gold in 1998, two years too quick. But if we go 2000 to 2024, we see a move in the gold price from $250 to $2,100. 8.6, 8.7% compounded a year for 24 years. I would ask investors who complain about that uh, to give their head a shake. Gold has done precisely what I asked it to do. It's maintained my purchasing power. So when the gentleman says he's being patient, I need to say, really? What were your expectations? In the world of finance and investment, few assets hold as much allure and historical significance as gold and silver. These precious metals have been coveted for centuries as stores of value, hedges against inflation, and safe havens in times of economic uncertainty. But navigating the complexities of the gold and silver markets requires more than just a basic understanding of supply and demand dynamics. It demands insight from seasoned experts who have witnessed the ebb and flow of these markets firsthand. In a recent conversation between renowned investors Rick Rule and Lynette Zhang, a wealth of knowledge and wisdom was shared regarding the intricacies of gold and silver investing. With decades of experience between them, Rule and Zhang provided invaluable insights into market dynamics, manipulation, and the importance of strategic planning in today's volatile economic landscape. Gold and silver stocks are often considered tertiary assets, meaning they are among the most marginal assets in a market crash. As Rule points out, during times of extreme market turmoil, even gold and gold equities can experience significant declines. This is because the decision to sell is often made not by individual investors, but by margin clerks seeking to liquidate assets to cover debts. Before we continue to delve into this discussion, please subscribe to our channel and activate the bell icon for timely updates. Gold and silver stocks are stocks. And in a market crash, uh, the tertiary assets, the most marginal assets, decrease the most. And there is no asset in the world more marginal <laughs> than a junior mining share. Stocks are stocks. I remember in the 1987 crash, gold and gold equities held up for precisely 24 hours. <laughs> and then they followed the market lower. Even gold uh, will be impacted, although gold will come back sooner. What happens in a crash is that the sell decision isn't made by the investor. It's made by the margin clerk. And the margin clerk doesn't care what you think about the relative value of your holdings are. They sell whatever has a bid to extinguish the debt to the house. Investors need to understand that in really precipitous declines, liquidity related uh, declines, there are no safe shelters. The investment categories that hold value recover the fastest. But in the immediate aftermath of a crash, there are no safe shelters with the exception of cash. I look back and I began to materially increase my own holdings uh, of gold in 1998, two years too quick. But if we go 2000 to 2024, we see a move in the gold price from $250 to $2,100. 8.6, 8 8.7% compounded a year for 24 years. I would ask investors who complain about that uh, to give their head a shake. Gold has done precisely what I asked it to do. It's maintained my purchasing power. So when the gentleman says he's being patient, I need to say, really? What were your expectations? <laughs> I, I'm not one of those who believes in any ongoing uh, multi-decade manipulation. I believe that uh, lower real and marginal gold and silver prices over 40 years had more to do with the strength of the US dollar and the perception, at least, that savers were enjoying real interest yields on U.S. dollar-denominated deposits than anything else. Why would you bother manipulating something that was going lower? Uh, you know, why would you try to suppress something that was falling of its own volition? Uh, I believe that the outlook changed in 2022, when what I believe was the real rate of inflation began to substantially exceed the yield available on U.S. dollar-denominated instruments at the same time that the risk associated with those instruments increased. I note that in the period 1967 to 1972, the circumstance was the same and the market didn't care. But after five years when the market did care, it cared in earnest. Now, as a follow-on with regards to manipulation, all markets are manipulated in the near term, gold being no exception. Markets as big as the LIBOR market, 
uh, and the U.S. Treasury market are manipulated in the very near term. And they are always manipulated in the direction that it is the easiest for the manipulators to manipulate. Uh, when gold markets begin to rise, it will be easier to manipulate those markets up, which occurred in my memory in the 1970s. For the last 40 years, the easy way to manipulate them is down. Uh, when you have a market, and I think we've talked about this before, Dunnigan, where the futures market is so much larger than the physical market, the temptation to short-term manipulation is particularly intense. Uh, it is not uncommon for the silver futures markets to trade 200 times the volume of silver available for good delivery in a day. <laughs> so uh, a manipulator could establish a short ladder if he or she expected the silver price to be more likely to decline, a short ladder involving a billion or a billion and a half dollars uh, in stages from three months out to two years, uh, and then borrow a fair amount of physical, which they dumped in the overnight market when the volumes were the least and where the damage they could do was the most, uh, and then enjoy the change that they had affected in the spot market and its outsize impact in the futures market. Uh, and, and I think that happens probably on a quarterly basis. There's no other explanation for very large selling of gold and silver in the overnight markets when the volumes are the skinniest. Uh, a rational seller would be trying to maximize his or her yield on sale. In this particular instance, whoever the seller is, is trying to maximize their impact in the futures market. I would suggest that this is not the Trilateral Commission or the International Jewish Conspiracy or the Fed. I would suspect that these are organized cabals around the trading desks of major international banks, the same people who manipulated the treasury market, the same people who uh, manipulated the LIBOR market, the same people who manipulated the euro, the euro dollar market. I think it depends on the vault. Uh, I think a bigger risk that people face in a bull market, a bigger risk than confiscation, is entrusting gold and silver to marginal vaults. Uh, if you're going to put money in a vault, make sure that the vault is controlled by a public company where you can see their balance sheet and their income statement. Make sure that the vault is subject to an outside audit every 90 days. It is so easy for the government to steal from you via taxation, via regulation, via inflation, via quantitative easing, that they have no need to steal your bullion. Uh, a tax increase or an excise tax <laughs> or printing up $2 trillion out of thin air is a kind of theft which is absolutely legal and, by the way, is always applauded by the voters. Why would Congress subject themselves to the ire of a populace that has 400 million guns in private holdings when they could steal much more very easily in a way that's very popular with the voters? Rule emphasizes the importance of understanding that in liquidity-driven declines, there are no safe shelters except for cash. He reflects on his own experience, noting that while he increased his holdings of gold in 1998, it took time for the market to recognize its value. From 2000 to 2024, gold experienced a remarkable increase from $250 to $2100, demonstrating its ability to preserve purchasing power over the long term. Regarding manipulation in the gold and silver markets, Zhang acknowledges that all markets are subject to manipulation in the near term. She highlights the disproportionate influence of the futures market, which can trade significantly more volume than is available for physical delivery. Zhang suggests that organized capital, particularly around the trading desks of major international banks, may be behind short-term manipulation tactics. Look at this, gold hits a fresh high after Powell says rate cut likely this year. So he's trying to pivot at the same time that inflation is remaining sticky. But do you really think that this has more value than this? Because if you do, 
there's a bridge in Brooklyn. I'd like to discuss selling you, and I don't even own it. And I don't even really, you could buy it. I don't want to buy it. But that, that what they're saying is that that little bit of interest is worth you risking your principal. I don't think so. There are strategies, if you're using bonds to generate income, there's strategies inside of my personal strategy that I developed based on all my work that I've done since 1987 on how to, to make sure that you have that income. And you need to, you need to understand what that strategy is. And I'm gonna be explaining this in different videos as we go through, because I can explain a lot more. So gold rose as much as 1.1% boosted by the Fed chair's comments during his congressional testimony. Powell said it will be likely be appropriate to begin lowering borrowing costs at some point this year, but made clear they're not ready yet. And with the data that came, just came out on inflation, they're not going to be ready yet for a while. He also said he's not looking for inflation to reach the central bank's 2% target to start easing policy. No, I think that what he's going to be looking for is a big crack in what is happening because the rapid ascent, this is what I really love, the rapid ascent, talking about spot gold, that has happened without any major catalyst. So what does that tell you? Zhang also warns investors about the risks associated with storing gold and silver in marginal vaults. She stresses the importance of choosing reputable, publicly traded vaults subject to regular audits to mitigate the risk of theft or confiscation. In response to recent comments by Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell, Zhang challenges the notion that a rate cut would be beneficial amid persistent inflationary pressures. She suggests that the rapid ascent of gold prices, despite manipulation efforts, signals underlying concerns about currency stability and the potential for hyperinflation. If spot gold is going up, which is a manipulated market anyway, because a rising gold price is an indication of a failing currency, and they don't really want you to know that. So if the pressure on gold pushes the visible price that you see higher against a backdrop of suppression, well, number one, now I don't, I don't do this very well yet, but I'm still going to give it a shot, right? Because when you push down um, on anything for a long enough and then you remove your hand, it shoots in a direction. And I've been showing you for a while that spot gold had done first two tops, then three tops, then four tops. And uh, also I showed you how it had broken out but that they were still suppressing it. So we had quadruple tops, which really never happens. But what's really happening with gold now is when you remove your hand, it shoots in a direction. So I think that it's really interesting that they're saying, oh, wow, this has happened without any major catalyst. Oh, really? Because my question to you is the catalyst for me is the hyperinflation that I believe has already begun. Are you ready for it? Because what you need is food, water, energy, security, barterability, wealth preservation, community and shelter. You need it in your hands because if you don't hold it, you don't own it. So ETFs, you don't own it. You don't own anything but a share in a trust that is designed to, to mimic the manipulated spot gold market. Whoop-de-flippin'-do. I mean, seriously.